struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Brian Bogert. Brian, how are you doing today? Man, I'm fantastic. Every time you and I get a chance to talk, it's a good day. I don't think everyone really understands that. Like if you get a chance to hop on my calendar, you should probably do it if you're listening to this. But Brian is a human behavior and performance coach, and he's on a mission to impact a billion lives. A billion? That's a billion with a B? Billion with a B, brother. Billion with a B, brother. That sounds like the name of another podcast out there. Billion with a B. Tell us how this how this works. What do you do? How does it impact the people? Yeah. Yeah. So I, th- I think it's important to give a little context first. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I want to just tell a short story because this will lead us right into the rest of our conversation and it'll help answer that question. Perfect. Please do. I want, I want you and anybody who's listening to just close their eyes for one second, unless they're driving, of course, because I don't want that to happen. And I promise you, I'll tell you when to reopen. I want you to imagine going to a store, having a successful shopping trip, heading outside, literally feeling the sun and the warmth of it hit your skin. You look up, You feel the breeze blow through your hair. You've got a pep in your step. You're ready to go on with your day. You get to your car. You're fumbling for your keys. And as you're standing there getting ready to unlock the doors, you turn your head and you see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you with no time to react. Go ahead and open your eyes. That's where this portion of my story begins. My mom, my brother, and I went to our local Walmart to get a one-inch paintbrush. And as we were headed back to our car, anybody who spent more than five minutes with me knows I've got an energy and vigor for life. And that's always been the case. So I wanted to get home and put that paintbrush to use. I was the first one in the car. My mom and brother were a few feet behind me. And this was before the time that we had key fobs. So I had to wait for my mom to literally get up to the car, stick the key in the door so we get on and go with our way. As I'm standing there, a truck pulls up in front of the store and driver and middle passenger get out. Passenger all the way to the right feels the truck move backwards. So he did what any one of us would do, Travis. He scooted over and put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Combination of shock and force threw him up on the steering wheel, up on the dashboard. And before you know it, he's catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at me with no time to react. We were in an end spot. He went up and over the median, went up and over the tree in the median, hit our car, knocked me over, ran over me diagonally, tore my spleen, left a tire track scar on my stomach, and continued on to sever my left arm completely from my body. It's a 115 degree day in Phoenix, Arizona. And all of a sudden this happened and I'm now laying on the pavement. My mom and brother watched it all take place and they look up and they see my arm laying 10 feet away. My guardian angel also saw the whole thing happen. There was a nurse that walked out of the store right when this took place. And she saw the literal life and limb scenario in front of her. And I'm forever indebted to this woman for her choice to go into action versus turning away to go on with her day. She came over and she immediately stopped the bleeding at the main wound and saved my life. And she instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler, fill it with ice to get my attached limb on ice within minutes to give me a fighting chance of having my arm reattached. And so I know that many people were not expecting it to go there today, Travis. (laughs) Uh, What I know is that I have a very, very unique story. But what I also know is that we all have unique stories. What's important is that we pause and become aware of the lessons we can extract from those stories and become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. And we all have the ability to do that. We also all have the ability to tap into the collective wisdom of other people's stories to shorten our own curve to learning. So I'm going to share with you two primary lessons, and that's where it's going to answer the question. The first lesson is I learned not to get stuck by what has happened to me, but instead get moved by what I can do with it. And the second, I didn't realize until far later. You see, at, six, at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, although I was the one having surgeries done, although I was the one having to go to therapy, I was also a kid and being guided through the process. So I was kind of in a fog. My parents, however, were not in a fog. They were intimately aware of the unceasing medical treatments, years of physical therapy. And the idea of seeing their son grow up without the use of his left arm was a source of great potential suffering for them. So they willed themselves day in and day out to do what was necessary, to do what was tough, to embrace the pains required to ultimately strengthen and heal me. So whether it was intentional or not, what they did was they ingrained in me a philosophy and a way of living, which is to embrace pain, to avoid suffering. And I believe when this is done right, this is also where we gain freedom. So it's these two techniques that that I've used to not only overcome this unique injury, but how my business partners and I built our last business to over 15 million within the span of a decade. And now how I flipped that on its head as a human behavior and performance coach to help individuals and organizations, just like you, just like the people listening, become more aware more intentional in who they already are, their most authentic selves. Because I think this is when magic happens and the door starts to crack to perspective, motivation, and direction. And I genuinely believe that if we can reduce the level of suffering on this planet, that is the only way 
that we give people the opportunity to experience joy, freedom, and fulfillment. It's the only way that they as individuals can stand up on their own two feet, not only confident, but convicted in who they are, knowing that the world's not going to just accept them, but will embrace them for exactly who they are. And it's when these things start to happen that we remove so much of the resistance and energy drain that takes place and creates suffering in our world. And I believe that if we do this, if we impact a billion lives, we just might, might have a chance of leaving this world a better place for my kids and my grandkids. And that's a fabulous story and a fabulous perspective. I know that I've shared my story many times on this program and we've talked about different things. One of the things I like to say is it's not your fault that the thing happened, but as your responsibility to heal from that trauma, move forward and use it to empower others. I'm smiling right now because I have never heard anybody else use those exact words except me. And I, I, that doesn't mean that other people don't say that, but I literally often say, is the fact that I suffered from shame my fault? No, but as soon as I become aware of it and I become aware of the damage that it's created, it's absolutely my responsibility, right? It's entering into a conversation with my wife and whatever triggers she may be carrying with her as a result of the way she was brought up or the way that she's been conditioned, right? Is that my fault? Absolutely not. But is it my responsibility as her partner to try to learn and be sensitive to where she may be triggered so that I don't have to put her into that defensive place? Absolutely. So, brother, man, I'm sorry. I, you saw me move because moved people move people, bro. And you are clearly moved. And the fact that you just articulated that as clearly and concisely as you did, and so in alignment with the same language that I talk about and teach about, there is, it's not a coincidence that we have been connected and we continue to be further connected through every conversation. So I just had to pause and say thank you because that's a powerful lesson I hope everybody heard. It's the way that we're going to change our community, our state, our country, and the world is when we stop pointing the finger at other people and point it back at ourselves and say, what can I do to move forward? We can play the victim game, right? You can pick on any news channel you want to. doesn't matter what side you're on. You can hop on social media and Twitter, and you can see the people that are fighting to see who can be the biggest victim. Or you can understand that, by and large, the system in this world are not designed to be against any person, group, or individual and see, all right, this is a game. How can I play the game? What are the rules of this game? How can I change the rules, gain an advantage, and win in life. And that's what we're going to be oh, talking about today. Oh, and by the way, today. the secret sauce in the game is understanding who you are, who you're doing this for, and who you're trying to impact. And when you actually allow yourself to recognize that your unhealed pain will remain, you will help you remain stuck. It will create more damage in your life, but that your healed pain, your healed processes, whether that's mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual, or perceived, by the way, your healed pain will actually become one of the greatest motivators towards whoever you want to become. And it allows you to actually remove some of the hurdles that limit what we all view as our entitled right to be free as human beings. Guess what? A lot of the constraints are because of the narratives of the world and the belief systems and emotional patterns that we've set up for ourselves to protect ourselves are actually what's keeping us trapped. It's not the outside world. It has to begin inside. And so that's, uh, again... Woo, Travis, man, I'm happy to be here with you today, brother. This is going to be a fun conversation. <laughs> it sounds like we can talk on just this microcosm of a topic oh. the whole time. Uh, and we probably could and should. But we are really trying to figure out today these emotional triggers that we mentioned, how we either hit the emotional trigger or avoid the emotional trigger, depending on what we're trying to accomplish with different groups of people. What does that look like in the nonprofit world? Yeah. So let me start by helping people understand what are emotional triggers. And let me start by also talking about why they can be so damaging. And then let's apply it to the nonprofit world, because I think it's really important that we give context here. You know, emotional triggers are things that literally cause us to react based on prior experience in our lives, patterns that have developed in our lives, and the environmental conditioning that's existed as a result of them. The thing is, is I know that people and organizations often use these terms like I'm stuck, we're stuck, we don't know where to go. And I think what's interesting is most people think they're stuck because they have the wrong strategy and tactics in their life, right? If I just do this next three-step system, if I go buy this next seven-step course on success, if I bring in a consultant to give me the four steps that's going to work for developing our culture, right? That, that we're going to unbreak the shackles that are keeping us stuck. We're going we're to break and we're going to move on. And it's not strategy and tactics. They're important, unbelievably important. 
and they will help you get places that you will never have gone if you get the right strategy and tactics. But that's not the shit that keeps you stuck. It's always a combination of emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, and environmental conditioning. And I believe the tip of that spear is emotional triggers, right? So emotional triggers are literally those things that cause us to react to things that maybe we don't understand. So, you know, our wife or spouse may look at us and imply that we loaded the dishwasher incorrectly. And then all of a sudden triggers an element of shame and defensiveness in us that has nothing to do with our spouse. It has everything to do with the way our grandma talked to us when we were five. But we don't actually respond that way. Instead, we react and then we create damage because then we list you know, all the things that we've done to learn how to load the dishwasher properly to defend the fact that we actually did do it with the best of our intent. But instead, we're in this position because we were triggered. And so when we understand triggers, this is what we have to start to realize. Triggers are designed to be pulled. So you can let your emotional triggers pull you and cause you to react, or you can pull the trigger on your emotional triggers and choose to respond. Reacting creates damage. Responding creates repair. And responding creates opportunity to go move forward objectively and non-judgmental. So triggers look like shame and how that impacts people and the way they show up and their worth. It impacts the way that you go into a business meeting and a conversation literally might be for someone like myself who's loud and talks fast. Somebody just as simple as putting the show, shh, you can't, like, you can't be that loud. Like, we're not going to get the result here, right? Which causes me then to shrink and feel badly about myself, change who I naturally am because the outside world couldn't handle who I was. And because I wasn't clear enough in who I was and unpacked the shame, I couldn't put myself in a position to say, no, 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 this is me and feel comfortable and good knowing that that's, that's not mine to carry. That's theirs. A trigger is caught, ca- us to react. And so we, we have started to not give a four step system but to bucket a thought process and a philosophy that people can apply to their own worlds to be able to take the inside out methodology. Problem with triggers is the outside world has already conditioned us to like, we need to move fast. We need to actually move forward. We need to be able to do things. So don't let your emotions affect you. Don't, don't, don't let them affect. Don't even pay attention to them. In fact, let's just shove them down. Let's make sure that we just keep that really tightly packed down there. Let's bury that so deep. We can barely excavate it. And just expect that that means you're not going to explode and react as a result of it. Like, we'll just, we'll just shove a bunch of pain all inside of you. That's what the world teaches us. It teaches us to move. And we'll come back to what that looks like. But the inside out, right? It actually starts with awareness. We have to become aware, first and foremost. Our minds process 11 million bits of information per second, but we're only consciously aware of about 40. What that says, we're largely led by the unconscious. So until we go through a systematic process of moving the unconscious to the conscious, the unaware to the aware, we're going to feel like a victim. We're going to feel like life is fate, like we have no influence or control over our destinies. Right now, we're about to literally unpack the secret to help anybody move through this and become free in their own world based on their own definition of success. But it starts with awareness. We got to become aware that we're affected by an emotion, whether it's anger, whether it's fear, whether it's scarcity, whether it's shame. And oh, by the way, a little secret here, I think 95% of people are suffering in some capacity from some element connected to shame. Shame is the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing because it literally manifests as all these different things, perfectionism, defensiveness, like all of perfectionism, all all the way to the board. How do I get defensive? What are the standards I'm setting for myself? The worth, the scarcity, okay? So we have to become aware that something has affected us. We have to be aware that that emotion has affected us and we have to start to become aware of where does it affect us? Does it keep us repeating the same patterns in our lives and our relationships and our work, right? Does it keep us doing the same things? Because that's what we were told we always should do. Oh, by the way, shame... Shame should is a shame-based word because it implies whatever we're doing isn't good enough. So we have to become aware. The second step is then we have to own it, okay? Ownership looks two two ways. Ownership is I need to own the fact that this emotion has impacted me now that I become aware of it. And I need to own the fact that it has impacted me in these ways. But here's the other side of ownership. Most triggers cause some element of damage unhealed, right? So I was talking with somebody yesterday who said, I don't know how to move through this. She was a victim of child sexual abuse and the victim of this through her father. She has a complete deep level of like lack of trust for men, no matter what. That causes her wall to go up, that causes her armor to go up in every single scenario. Guess what? She's going to have people say things to her that she's not going to hear based on their actual intent. She's going to hear it through the lens of the world that she shaped for herself. That's going to cause a reaction, which is either going to be to wall off, put off a negative energy, right? Maybe push them away and not actually see what's actually happening in front of her based on this trigger and this deep trauma that never got healed as a kid. She needs to own the fact that guess what? It was not her fault that this happened to her, but it was her responsibility that this went unhealed and that the reactions caused damage to other people. So you have to own that and actually start to repair in those areas. Then we have to root it. We have to unroot it. What is the root or root of that emotion? In her case, one of the roots is very clear, right? But there's another one that 
has probably happened as a result of the messaging and the narrative that she also received because she was a victim. And guess what? We didn't used to know how to handle victims, particularly in the result of sexual abuse and violence. So now all of a sudden she's having to relive her victimhood, re-justify who she is and what happened to her, re-experience the trauma time and time again without actually somebody being there to heal it because this happened 40 years ago. It was a different time. She had to unroot that and unroot the other ancillary elements of it so that she can move through it. This is the most complicated part. And then we're going to come back full circle. Okay. Because I know you have got a question about nonprofits. I've got a ton of stuff. I got a ton of stuff listed in here, Brian. Movement is really where it breaks down for most people. Most people, if they're really intentional, can become aware, they can own it, and they can typically unroot at least one of the major roots that created this emotion. Movement's the hardest part. Because movement is how does it move in your body and how do you move through it in life? Okay. So I'll give a perfect example. I suffered from shame deeply in my life, but shame doesn't show up the same way in every area in my life. And so I have to understand how does shame actually manifest in my body? How does it move in my body in different environments and situations? I'll give you an example. Okay. Literally the one in a boardroom was accurate. That was my own story. My entire life, people tell me I'm too loud and I talk too fast and I have too much energy. And I literally shamed myself. So I'd be in that environment and I would literally, somebody would nudge me on the shoulder and I would literally feel myself shrink. I'd bite my tongue. I'd all of a sudden feel like I, what I was going to say or how I was going to say it wasn't good enough because I'm constantly being judged through the lens of what everybody else is doing. And so shame would literally keep me stuck and trapped there. Shame also would show up though, is because being a husband and father is the most important job I have on this planet. It's my most important role. It's my greatest responsibility. But if my wife would say something a few years ago and she'd be like, hey, are you going to spend some time with our son this weekend? No charge behind it. No negative intent behind it. But guess what I heard? You haven't been spending enough time with your son. And I'd move into a defensive position. I'd list off the 10 things I'd done in the last four days to demonstrate that I was a good husband and father when that wasn't even about what my wife was asking me. But I would turn to a defensive and anger, right? So two different situations, both based in shame that moved in my body differently. I have about six different shame ways that it moves in my body. This is where it breaks down for most people because it doesn't look like the same thing. But guess what? That's what it is. It's rooted in shame. So when I can see the six different ways that it happens, then I can start to identify and match patterns to those triggers, how I'm getting triggered and how it moves through my body so that I can pause in those moments, ask myself, is this true or is this based in my trigger and actually move through that in a different path to recreate new patterns, both for myself and break the generational pattern of how I've learned to grow up in this world and operate, which again, isn't just because of my parents, it's because of the environment, employers, teachers, coaches, the messages that I've ingrained because of the view I have in the world. Triggers have to be moved through. And it's highly complex because I told you I have six different shame ways that it moves in my body. I have over 50 shame triggers. It's highly complex. But when I can actually start to recognize that and move through this, that's when you get to become free because they no longer trigger you. They can flow through you. You can actually now have influence and control over the way you show up. I tell I'm going to pause because I know I just dropped a lot. You, you, you did. Uh, I want to unpack some of this and I'm going to try to relate it to something I've learned recently. And it's going to be a lot just like you. I, I want to see if it's along the same lines or if I'm completely out of lunch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I went down to a conference and we talked about how to reprogram your mind was one of the things that we talked about. And we talked about all the different ways that we take in different things. And one of those things is how we perceive the thing, not what happened, but how we perceive it actually helps to create the memories and whatnot. And you talked about all the amount of information that we're taking in constantly, but we really only onboard like 40 bytes of all this terabyte of information. How they explained it is you've got this big warehouse and you've got a person that's your filing clerk and your decision maker in the middle of the room. And they've got a little filing cabinet right next to you. But on the ground of this warehouse is just a ton of loose papers that never made it into the filing cabinet. And if you've ever seen, I love Lucy where they're working on the chocolate line and the chocolate is just coming along. Oh yeah. It speeds up and they can't handle it. So she ends up eating some, putting it in her pocket and they're not making it. it. You get this constant flow of information. This is what's going on with your filing clerk in your brain is there's just constant information coming in and they've got a couple of microseconds to decide, is this valuable or not? And going in the filing cabinet or if it's just going to make its way into the warehouse floor. And the big differentiator, as far as I understand it, is emotion is the deciding factor if it's going to be a priority and go in the filing cabinet or no emotion and it's going to end up on the floor. But here's the deal. 
whenever something happens in your life, that filing clerk goes back through the filing cabinet, right? Things that have been prioritized and attached to a motion and says something like, oh, is Travis going to lose weight? Let's see. He's tried to do this about 40 times. It's worked out twice. Uh, I've decided you're not going to lose weight this time. And because of all the things that are in the filing cabinet, they've decided no matter what I do, it's not going to happen because of what's already been in my filing cabinet. But what does this look like as a parent? As a parent, your kid from birth to seven years old, they don't have a filter. They onboard whatever it is that you tell them. If you tell them that you can design your own world, that what everything has been created in this world has started as a thought, and you can take whatever thought you get and create whatever you want in life, if that's onboarded at seven, you're golden. You could, that's your operating system. You can do whatever it is they told you. But if they told you that you're dumb or that someone else is responsible for your problems or this type of person is the bad guy, that's their operating system that they're going to operate on until they start creating enough new files to change that narrative. Okay, reprogram the operating system. Yeah. Is that how you understand you're, it? So you're, you're, spot, you're spot on. Here's where I want to take it a thought further. Because directionally, it is, it's a thousand percent in line. Okay. But here's a, a thought. What if that filing clerk could be neutral in every moment? Neutral, non-objective, or sorry, neutral, objective, and non-judgmental. What if that filing clerk could do exactly what you just said and recognize that perception? Ryan Holiday in The Obstacles Away has one of the greatest quotes because it aligns so much with the way I view the world, right? He says, there is no good or bad without us. There is the event that happens and the story we tell ourselves about it. When you look at emotional triggers, all emotional triggers do is literally shift the lens that you're viewing a situation through to already have a bias. That's all it is, mm. right? I told you about the situation with my wife. I told you about what happens in the boardroom. I told you about this one, one woman that I was talking with yesterday. We have a bias that we have shaped a worldview around that, oh, by the way, doesn't always need to exist. So if we have those couple of milliseconds, but we have a clerk that truly can be neutral, objective, and non-judgmental, like that's where true freedom comes from. Mm-hmm. What, what we're talking about, though, is the only way to do that is that filing clerk's got to do some double duty for a little while because that filing clerk has to go back in all of your old files and actually start the reprogramming process mm-hmm. and start to recognize, okay, well, it's this one that I filed back when I was age 12. Well, guess what? Like I actually did have a jaded lens in the way I was viewing that. And so what it actually did was create a pattern that put me into environments that only conditioned that belief system. And so I've never actually been able to reprogram it because I haven't spent the time in that right? To go back and do it. So if we don't look at it as, oh, I've got a millisecond to determine where I file it, but we look at these things as not a matter of time, but a matter of place and fit and alignment of who we are in our thought process. Then that filing clerk, once they do double dirty and clean up all the old files, which is what I'm talking about, that process of going through aware, own, unroot, and move, that's literally putting your filing clerk in double duty because they have to not only do this real time, but you have to also go back and actually start to reprogram the old historical beliefs and challenge yourself on, did I see that as good or bad? What was the actual event that happened? What story did I tell myself about that accident? Mm -hmm. And when I talk about pausing to become aware of the lessons we can extract and becoming intentional with how we apply them in our lives, that's what I'm talking about. Like go back and look at the events, do the work. Because that filing clerk, once you do all the historical stuff, once they do double duty, now all of a sudden they become like a hyperspeed moving machine in real time and forward pace where you're truly unlocked. So when we work with people in a high capacity of coaching, that's truly what we're getting them to is how do we unlock their potential by allowing them to see themselves accurately, mm-hmm. by allowing them to see themselves more clearly and allowing them to see who they can become without limitations based on what the narratives of the world have shaped in their own filing system. So your thought process is exactly right. What I'm trying to challenge is how do we put that filing clerk into intentional action, both historically, real time, and future focused. Yeah. How do you, how do you do that folder cleanup? I think is what you're just talking about. When you mentioned that someone said something like, you're being too loud for the situation that caused you to shrink. One of the ways we can adjust that filing clerk and what they do is because they've got nonstop information coming at them. If we can, if we can delay the process just a little bit, and we can do this by asking questions like, is this person, someone calls you a jerk, be like, is this person an expert on jerks? Are they qualified to give a qualified opinion on this matter? And if you can delay it just a couple of moments, you prevent new negative files from getting in your filing cabinet. Correct. Correct. And 
you can add because we have perceived, right? Perceived things that we can put into our mind to add new positive files. I know there's a little story floating out there about Dennis Rodman, who was always listening to his headphones. And every time he was asked, he's like, what is this? And he's like, it's Pearl Jam. And one of his coaches came up to him one time. He's like, hey, what are you listening to? And don't say Pearl Jam. He took off the headphones and put them on the coach. And he was reprogramming himself. It was his voice. It was his recording. He said, Dennis Rodman is the greatest rebounder of all time. Dennis Rodman gets all rebounds over and over and over again. I don't know everything that was said, but he's adding new files in his voice. So in the moment, the ball's up in the air. He jumps up while file clerk goes, I I can't, I don't have time historically to check everything, but the last 45 files says Dennis Rodman's getting this rebound. Right. That's right. It's decided the file clerk says, you got it. And his hand goes up and he's got the ball. And then he's then reinforced because you attach emotion to what just happened. You reinforce a bigger a file. positive associated way. Absolutely. Yep. And, and what you have, he's, he's, he's created a system to make sure that his internal voice is louder than the voices of the world. Yes. Which is yes. something that we talk about a lot. And so I'm going to hit on again. I, I, we're just going to have and flow here. Cause like you, you dropped some really amazing things just there. You're right. right. The, the thing is, is what do we do in that moment? Right. When I said we can pause in the movement phase, those are the moments that we can pause and ask ourselves if this is true. That's also the moment when we pause to take a breath. And oh, by the way, our filing clerk in that moment, we don't have to process real time in that moment to know what to do with it. We can also instruct our filing clerk to be like, okay, observed, put this over to the side and earmark it because I need to come back and revisit the situation later so I can make sure I understand it unbiased. Mm -hmm. Right. Because then once we do it, we can go back in and be like, okay, and ask those questions because we don't always have time in the moment to ask the questions to clarify Mm -hmm. where it gets really cool is when we can start to ask the questions real time to challenge the thought in the room. That's when the energy really changes. And that's great, but it has to start with the internal questions we ask ourselves because it's like, do I put credibility in this? Should I listen? Do I, do I need to like, how do I feel about this? Was I out of line? What, right. What could I do differently next time based on what that experience was, what was happening on the other side was the person that I was actually talking to responding in a way that I was unaware of. Was my speed, my cadence, my tone, my volume actually putting them off where the outcome is going to be derailed? If that's the case, guess what? That's my responsibility, right? So the reality of it is you just have to see it for what it is. And I've dangled this awareness thing from with it. I've I've used this analogy recently that I'm starting to really like. It's almost like you have a, a, a microphone that's hanging from the center of the room. And it's a 360 degree microphone that can pick up everything. Understand it. Again, neutral, objective, non-judgmental. Your filing clerk is receiving all these variables and information in a way that it knows what it is. You just see it. But then when you can move your consciousness from a place that you do that to now I've got a really directional boom mic because I need to hone in and focus here. Right now, I need to hear this and process it and understand it. When we can start to do that from a place of consciousness, that's when we really start to change the game. Right, Dennis Rodman, that's all he's doing. And what he's doing is buying into a philosophy that we believe into, which is I am statements. I am statements are answered to who are you question, right? They're some of the most powerful words that are in the English language because the words that follow I am follow you, right? So I, I could say, Travis, who are you? And you could answer the question literally based on one of two things, based on the things that you've already done, who you believe yourself to be, the things that you've already accomplished, or based on who you want to become, the things you want to accomplish and where you want to go. Both are equally powerful. But that's why Muhammad Ali used to say, I am the greatest. And in an interview, literally early in his career, one of the, one of the people said, why do you say that to yourself? And he said, because I started saying it to myself early and often, long before I believed it, and certainly before the world knew who I was. But I told myself if I could say it to myself early enough, often enough, and consistent enough, that I would soon believe it and the world would soon follow. That's the power of reprogramming who we are based on our own internal narrative being louder than the narratives of the world, brother. I love that we talk about that from the perspective of inside out, because yes. the problems really come when we define ourselves from the outside in. Like right now, I'm active duty Navy. When we're recording this, I'm not sure when this is going to be live. But if I define myself as my title, my rank or position, like currently it is Navy Lieutenant, Naval Flight Officer, Division Officer of Current Operations at Stratcom Wing 1. If I define myself by those titles and those external things, when I retire, and I have a feeling that this is where a lot of veterans struggle, I lose that title. I then lose my identity. And if I've defined myself with I am statements that say those things, then when those change, have I lost who I am? Yeah. So by the way, what you just even talked about is the fact that we're actually conditioned from the time we grow up to chase the what. 
right? What amount of success, what car, what house, what title, what job, what spouse, what, and it's all based on the shoulds, right? You said it best in the first seven years, we're great. We're born as the brightest burning light we're ever going to be. And then parents, teachers, employers, coaches, everybody around the world starts saying, you should do this. You shouldn't do that. You should be this. You should want that. You shouldn't drive that car. You should drive that car. You should have that amount of money. Nope. You shouldn't have that. Right. And all it does is start creating these what's where we chase the what's. And by the way, I did this. I was deeply broken. Like who I am today is a byproduct of a long journey that we are not going to have time to unpack today. But the point is, is, is when you chase the what, you might get it. You likely will get it if you're focused enough, but you're going to lose the who in the way. And part of the reason I'm doing what I do today is because I was running in circles with people making seven figures, eight figures in some cases, high six figures in a lot of cases. People that had gotten all the what's, the cars, the houses, the money, the, the things that everybody says we want based on the external definition of success. And guess what? Everybody was miserable, including myself, because I'd lost who I was. But when you go through the process of rewriting your narrative, you go through the process of rediscovering who you are and you get really clear in that, you, that becomes your foundation. Literally put who before what, then all the what's in your world actually become a manifestation of the who not the other way around. It becomes way more powerful. That's why we've got this whole idea of who before what. Like It has to be there. Who before what? People before profits. So I'm going to bring this full circle to the question you asked me that got us on this giant riff. How does this apply to nonprofits? Okay, How can we deploy this in, in, in our world as it relates to donors, volunteers, um, internal staff, all of the people that are going to support our cause, our mission? And I'm going to also say that this answer, by the way, is not much different than any for-profit organization either. Because if it goes back to the human element, it goes back to the human experience, it goes back to how do we actually move through our emotional triggers. This is universal thought that applies to everybody, but I'm going to speak to it through the lens of nonprofit language. Here's the deal. Nobody really wants to be sold. Nobody really wants to be put on a defensive. Nobody wants to feel like they should have to do anything. Nobody wants to feel in a position of expectation. Right? What we all desire in the human experience, if I boil it down to four things, we all want to feel safe. We all want to feel protected. And oh, by the way, those two things are not the same thing. We all want to feel seen and understood. And we all want to feel connected. So if we look at these things and we recognize, okay, if we focus on the human experience, human connection is one of those other things. It's the last one on the item. The other first three elements have to exist for that to truly happen. But if we're connecting with donors, volunteers, staff, it's no different, right? What we're really doing is how do we focus on this? Guess what? I believe that the glue that binds human connection is vulnerability and authenticity that are all rooted in our only ability to show those things is through understanding our emotional triggers. True strength actually hides behind vulnerability. And that's what most people forget, right? The lack of vulnerability is what? Carrying an armor to protect ourselves based on the narratives that the world's created for us that just gets heavier and more progressively heavy over time that starts to actually crush who we are. The greatest strength is actually dropping the armor and being vulnerable and exposed and knowing you're going to be okay. So how do we approach this with donors? We've seen a giant shift in the donor world over the last decade. I think we're going to see an even greater shift after what happened in the, these last 18 months, we're already seeing it, right? From undesignated to designated giving. What that means is that donors are getting to a point where they no longer trust organizations. Because if they trusted organizations, they wouldn't have to designate gifts because they would know that for every dollar they gave, it's going to go to the best place possible. So what don't they trust? They either don't trust that the intent is in the right place, that the cause is in the right place, that they have the right systems, the right people, the right whatever, right? That's, that's what they're questioning. So if I can designate my gift, I'm going to give a million dollar gift and I want it to go to this program and this entity based on these parameters. And this is the only way it can be spent. What that's saying is I don't trust the organization to be good stewards of the dollars I want to invest in the mission. So how do we better understand where our donors actually want to align their focus? How do we create opportunities for them to be a part of a conversation to create the solutions that are designed in a way that they want? And by the way, not all donors want to do that, but I'm talking about at least give them the opportunity and the invitation. Because all we typically do in nonprofits in a lot of cases is give them an opportunity to give, right? And come to our annual gala, come to our annual fundraising meeting. Yeah. And, and what we talk about is everybody, that, okay, we're going to get table captains. Let's go do this. Make sure you know, they're, you tell them there's going to be an ask at the end. What does that do? It puts people on the defensive because it's an expectation versus a desire aligned with value that an organization can deliver. So instead, let's, let's, let's change the conversation here. What we have to do as an organization is move through our own internal emotional triggers first. I'm a big believer that you've got to focus on yourself. Then you've got to focus on your staff and your team that you're working on. Then you've got to focus on the volunteers that help perpetuate the mission. Then you've got to focus on the donors. We've but I don't backwards. understand, Brian. Aren't the dollars everything? Yeah, that's the way. Again, we go people over profits. It's the same thing in nonprofits, except that in this case, it's saying people over nonprofits. So we're just, right? This is, this is actually even better. But in this case, we're putting nonprofit over people. That doesn't make any sense. Think about that. Nonprofit over people when the whole reason for nonprofit is to focus on people. 
Nonprofits exist to benefit people in some way. Systems, resources, right? Quality of life, like that's all nonprofits do. They focus on benefiting other people. Yet we lose that. We're like, we got to focus on generating just the dollar first because otherwise we can't imp- focus on people first and start internal. Build a culture, build a brand, build a system where your folks internally feel safe. They feel seen, they feel protected and they feel connected to the cause, the mission and the leadership. It's got to start at the top. But when you do that, you can reshape the organization so that, oh, by the way, we don't have to have our folks going out who are lacking worth, who don't know how to position and ask for the dollars when the opportunity actually comes to have a conversation to ask for it. But here's the beautiful part. If you do all this right, you never even have to ask because they're going to see it's so logical to give in this place. Why wouldn't you do this? So this is one of the things that we did with an organization a few years back. And I say we, meaning it was truly collectively. I take no credit for this. I was a member of the board. I helped, right, I helped with thought process and doing these things. But it started with limitations with the way the organization operated. Emotional triggers based on their own scarcity, their own lack of resources. CEO, COO, right? What, they all came together and they said, they came to us very proud. We're going we're gonna to launch it. And they said it sheepishly, by the way. We're going to launch a $13 million capital campaign. And we think if we do this over the next five years, like we can... We can actually perpetuate some of the causes. We can rehouse some folks that, were, by the way, are veterans that have been displaced that we've got a contract. This time. We might be able to bring in some, we can do all these things. And I was like, what? what? Well, you're you're going to take 13 million over, over five years when your current operating budget is already $40 million? Like we already have momentum. Like why don't we understand that we need to change the thought process here? So, so you know, w- w- there was some challenging in the room. And I basically stood up and I said, no, this needs to be a $20 million campaign minimum. And we need to be proud of the fact that we're doing this. Because it also means that we know the impact that we're going to have and how we support this. At that moment, there had never been a seven-figure gift in the history of the organization. Do you know why there'd never been a seven-figure gift? Never they never delivered a seven-figure idea. <laughs> They'd never delivered a seven-figure idea because they didn't believe they could deliver a seven-figure idea. They didn't believe they could be operating at that level. So guess what? We reshaped it. It went into a $20 million capital campaign. It became something that there was a deep amount of resistance internally, a lot of fear, a lot of struggle, a lot of shame. Like we're, we're a nonprofit that literally helps people feed, clothe, house, and heal. We work with the underpoverished population. How can we be proud going out and talking about a $20 million capital campaign? Oh, because by the way, you could also tag a $5 million endowment on the back end and show demonstrated support that this is now a sustainable program. So why don't we think differently and act differently and recognize that if we do this right, we're going to open ourselves up for something pretty special. In the first year of the campaign, there were seven seven figure gifts. Not a single time was it asked. It was so obvious that this is where the money needed to go that all of the billionaires in our state showed up and gave a seven figure gift, many of whom, by the way, have renewed through other steps. We did over $20 million in 18 months, and they're already almost complete with that $5 million endowment now with another 18 months. They've built a farm that's producing 80,000 pounds of organic food that's a no-way system because they feed people in their own clinics. They've got the largest commercial kitchen in the state. They've now redeveloped the way that they're doing their thrift stores because they found that it actually was a loss leader, but it was important. But how do we get more efficient and eliminate some of the costs out of this so that we can free up resources to put people in front of the cause? They've reshaped everything. And guess what? They just landed a $5 million investment, not a gift, an investment. They shifted and they went in and they put together a business plan went to one of the largest organizations, one of the largest, um, uh, it'll come to me in a second, the word just blanked from my head, uh, foundations, sorry. I don't know why that slipped my head. They went to one of the largest foundations in the country and they put together a business plan that said, if you invest $5 million, this is the ROI we're going to deliver on that money. None of those $5 million is going to go directly to the cause. We're building the system to make sure we can perpetuate and create $5 million every single year because of the investment that you make. And we'll be doing that within three years. Here's the business plan. They landed that because they changed the way they viewed it because they got out of their own way. They started to remove their emotional triggers. They started to focus on their people internally. And they started to create an opportunity where all of their volunteers, which was second, were so passionate about it. They were acting as if they were part of the organization. When you've got volunteers acting as if they're a part of the organization, not volunteering and having their name on a board so they can show that on their LinkedIn profile, but they're actually as committed to the cause as the staff or more, donors don't ask questions. They just say, where do I jump in? When you demonstrate so much value, so much impact because of the way that you can create a culture and environment to make sure that your internal people, your staff, your volunteers, your donors all feel safe, protected, seen and understood and connected, which is all rooted in emotional triggers, you unlock the game for your organization. And oh, by the way, this is true for every organization, not just nonprofit.
Well, Brian, I don't know where the heck we go from there. I tell you that right now. I got chills. I don't get chills very often because most people don't have anything really impactful to say. I got chills, Brian. Thank you. We have problems in the nonprofit world. People don't like to talk about these problems. They are scarcity, the way we treat our staff internally, which causes a 14 to 18 month window where we're churning and burning through people like they don't matter at all in result, in actuality. These are the people that get the things done that we want to get done so we can have the impact that we want to have. 100%. You have to start internal. We're treating these people terribly for no reason other than we have poor vision and we have no idea how to put a system in place that doesn't burn our people out. Yeah. It's also the fact that as organizations, we operate from a scarcity standpoint because we bought into the external world. And how many donors ask the very first question, what percentage of my dollar goes to impact the cause? And we as nonprofits don't have the stones to sit there and say, you know what? We operate at 85%, but here's why. We don't tout 95% 95 of every dollar goes to this cause because we're actually shooting you and the cause in the foot. What we recognize is when we can take that extra 10%, establish the right leadership, the right systems, the right methodology, what it actually does, it allows us to perpetuate greater growth for our organization. So would you rather have 95% on a $40 million budget go to the cause? Or would you rather have 85% of a $120 million organization go to the cause? You ask the question, and what are they going to say? We don't have the ability and the strength and the worth and what we're doing. We don't believe in it enough to be able to actually say, no, we know that we're actually doing more for the cause with less percentage of the dollar, because it's not about the percentage of every dollar. It's about the volume of dollars. That's what we're talking about here. How do we create more impact? We create more impact by create, by eliminating the resistance between how do we actually have more impact and doing it? It's because we say, well, we're going to operate off 95 cents on every dollar. So what do we do? We don't have, have leadership. We overwork our folks. We burn them out. We don't give them direction. We don't give them resources. We expect them to be the ones to carry the weight with our donors. But then what we don't recognize is why do our donors get pissed off and feel like our brand doesn't represent who we are? Well, because our frontline staff who interacts with them, the ones that are actually the face of the organization are miserable. Why would they want to give dollars to a miserable representative who's faking it clearly to show up because it's their job to raise funds? What if we flipped it on its head and we invested in our people? Then we don't even have to ask. You can't expect to call up Emmett Smith out of retirement, pay him league minimum and expect to win the Super Bowl. That's my point. You can't do it. Invest in your organization if you really want to invest in your cause. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've seen examples time and again where people had a $6 million marketing budget and raised an astronomical amount. And then some hatchet piece came out in the news says, I can't believe they have a $6 million marketing budget. They took it down to a $50,000 marketing budget and they raised less than 4% of the previous year's earnings. It is not... The percentage, it is not the dollar. If you want to impact millions upon millions of people, it's going to take millions upon millions of dollars. But guess what? The system is broken. And we as nonprofits are perpetuating the brokenness because we aren't standing up for how it actually needs to operate. Truthfully, like Absolutely. at the end of the day, if we had the courage as nonprofits to stand up to donors, to literally challenge that news story and say, yeah, guess what? Here's what actually happened because of this news story. We reacted based on our own emotional triggers because we didn't want to lose the donors and the credibility based on our brand because we weren't confident enough in who we were as an organization. So we changed it. We reduced our $6 million budget to 50, but here's what happened in terms of impact. So by the way, why doesn't that news story get aired? And say, guess what? Our our narratives are broken. You guys put this narrative to put pressure on this nonprofit. And guess what? All we did was impact the people we actually cared about that they were supporting through their cause. It's backwards. But why don't we fight for actually making an impact? And I don't mean fight, like create tension. I mean, stand up for what we believe in. Scarcity and fear. Emotional triggers. back. It's the root of everything. And emotional triggers. If right now, I'm I'm a soon-to-be veteran, right? I'm at duty right now. There is 53,000 plus nonprofit organizations dedicated to helping military. What you don't see is all the squabbling between the groups. What you don't see is people putting out reports of actual, tangible impact and numbers. 
The Veteran Golf Association is a fantastic organization. They have competition. They have teams. They keep score. And for 13 years, they didn't have a single suicide up until a couple of weeks ago. But why are they not putting out their successes of 13 years without a single person? Because that's not what we focus on. We focus on profit. We focus on how are we like, what are we doing? Guess what? Have you heard me give any goal for our organization from a monetary standpoint? No. All we're measuring is impact. Now, do we have to be aware and knowledgeable of what our PL is so that we have the resources to support the people and perpetuate the cause? Absolutely. Am I going to run and be a good steward of our business? Absolutely. But we're measuring it based on impact. We're chasing a billion life impact because that's the only thing that matters to me. Money will produce itself. It proves itself every time we focus on it less. It just manifests into people's worlds. It's insane. When we focus on impact, it, all of a sudden we're removing the resistance that's allowing us to receive what we need to perpetuate the impact. It's no different here, but you're exactly right. Here's the other thing. Brene Brown outlined, and I think it was Dare to Lead that she wrote this. And I'm going to butcher the numbers, but it's fascinating. And it's the truth. Think about it from a military perspective. The 1940, 1945 military leadership handbook had over 140 references to emotional things, emotional resiliency, emotional intelligence, trauma, PTSD, understanding what these things are. The field book for the military today has zero. They focus on situational leadership, organizational leadership, positional leadership, all of the above that have not like they just take the people out of the process. And so you talk about the military, like think about that. If one of the things that protects our country has lost sight of the fact that we're dealing with people, not machines, we aren't focusing on emotion triggers. And by the way, this isn't a bash on the military. The point is, I'm trying to bring this that this needs to be a conversation in every organization. We need to start remembering that it's people first. Everything in this world is about people. Everything. So when people ask me what I'm an expert in, that's what I answer. I'm an expert in people. Just for context here, the current military slogan is mission first, people always. Which is interesting because that only further supports my point. Mission first. Knowing that the mission can't happen without the people. But guess what? The mission won't ever happen unless people are first. Absolutely. And you see military leadership trickle out and down into culture. You hear people like Jocko Willink that take responsibility, extreme ownership and what the leader looks like and putting it on the leader to take care of the people. And you see the outcome. There's a reason why he's made so much money with his books and his podcast is so popular because he he focuses on you. Yeah. Yeah, He focuses on you and you can see the people in leadership like Colin Powell, the Mm -hmm. retired general, all he focused on was people first. And you can see how that worked out for him splendidly, amazingly. And you can tell the people that are out there and I'm going to get some flack for this. And I hope I do hold me accountable. You see people out there that had the external tag of identification. I was a soldier. I was a sailor. I was a Marine. I was an airman. I was a coast guardsman. I was a Space Forceman. I don't know what the Space Force calls themselves. I can't answer that. I'm sure someone will tell me. And they lose that and they've lost all their identity because they've put their identity into an organization. Right. The organizations want, military or not, the organizations want your identity to become a part of the organization. And what we have to be really careful of as organizations and leaderships is we can't ever push that on people. We need to focus on the individuals. And if the individual selects that this is a part of a mission and a role they want to play, then it becomes more powerful. But if we force that this is a part of your identity and we, we contribute to them losing themselves, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot if we contribute to that narrative. Absolutely. We're missing things in the nonprofit world, in the veteran world. We're missing something called accountability. Yeah. We're not holding ourselves accountable. We're not holding each other accountable. We yep. have this infighting. We're fighting for the scarce dollar. Here's the deal. Hungry, hungry hippos. When all the marbles are gone, the game is over. But in the hungry, hungry hippos of life and the marbles are gone, you just make more marbles. Yeah. You just make more marbles. There's enough to go around. There's more than enough to go around. There's something like four quadrillion dollars out there. Yeah. There's That's plenty. million, money. billion, trillion, quadrillion. We don't have our first trillionaire yet. I hope that's me and my team. We're going to be the first trillionaire. Because <laughs> that's the kind of vision I have. I am the Bro, greatest. I, no, I, I say I, it before I, I, I believe I laugh, it. Not, not to minimize. I'm saying I love that. I'm laughing because you're like, no, no, I, want, I, I think I could be the first trillionaire. And what's cool about you is it's actually not about the dollar either. It's not about the dollar. It has nothing to do with the dollar. 
That's that exactly why I laugh. With the so, that's what's so powerful did. in what you said is that most people will listen to this unless I just rephrase it. They'd be like, wait a minute. Now he just said he's going to. No, no, no. No, he knows that if he does what he wants to do, he perpetuates who he is and his mission. He knows he's got a damn good shot of also happening, happening to create a lot of wealth through his entities that are also going to be impact first. Exactly. The impact that it's going to create is going to affect every person in every generation. It's going to take my story. It's going to take Brian's story. And it's going to take it from being the exception because we are exceptional. It's going to make it the rule. So everyone has the ability to leverage the things that we've talked about today, not just have pockets of prosperity out there. It's not for a select group of people. It's for everyone. Everyone has the ability to do this. Here, here's the really interesting thing about that thought process too. If we think about it, everybody in every category of life can have their own definition of success. Everybody, regardless of your story, my story has a story. That's the crazy thing. Anybody that's listening to this right now, and we, we don't give credit to this because people are like, well, I'm stuck. Well, I can't have that. Well, I can't have this. Well, do you even want it? Truthfully. But like when, when we actually pair that back and we recognize that everybody's got elements of pain, everybody's listening right now you're a survivor. Like everybody gets by. Like we are highly adaptable beings that learn how to adapt and mold and we all survive. Now we don't all thrive. And again, I'm going to come back not to beat a dead horse, but I genuinely think that regardless of class, it's these external narratives. It's what it's done to condition us. And it's the emotional triggers and behavioral patterns that have kept us feeling like we can't have accountability. We can't have ownership. We can't have influence over control. But guess what? There are so many people on this planet that don't desire to be a trillionaire or to have an impact of a billion lives. That's okay. Like, that's completely okay. If your entire definition of success is to make 40 grand a year and live with your spouse and kids and have a beautiful, happy life, or to not have any of that and make 20 grand or 100 grand or five, like, who cares? If that's what you want, you can have it. Like, we truly can. So, the question is what's keeping you from feeling this idea of, Joy, freedom, and fulfillment. What's this idea of helping you feel happy? It's all these external narratives and the shaming that we do and self-judging we do, telling ourselves that we're not where we could be. Or I can't be like Travis, or I can't be like Brian. You're right, you can't, because you're not me. But I can't be like you. I can't do the things you do. I don't know what your world looks like. I don't know the perspectives that you bring to the table. Right? The pain that I deal with is not your pain. Your pain, though, is your pathway to success. You, You just have to start to recognize that, like, Truly, it's okay to live whatever life you want. So if you really want to go from just surviving, which all of us have already done, we've already gotten by, we're highly adaptable. That's amazing. Now, how do you create a pathway and a, and a platform and a thought process and a belief system to allow yourself to feel so that you can heal so that you then can actually start to move in a place that, guess what? You can have everything you want because you can thrive regardless of what level that means to you. So that's the thing that's crazy about this is everybody listening to this has no better or worse opportunity than you or I. We're all survivors because we're here. You've already beat the odds. just want to survive. 400 trillion to one to even be born. And the fact that you're still alive is insane. But the best I can do with all of my effort, all the mindset, the best I can do is be the second best Brian. (laughs) I could put everything into chasing you and what you are and who you are and what you've built and what you designed. And the best I can do is second place. It's like everyone competing with Chuck Norris. The best you can do is second place. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't even do push-ups. He pushes the world down. What, how do you, how do you <laughs> live up to that? <laughs> but, you're, but that's the exact point, Travis. That is the exact point. Focus on you. Become who you are. I'm telling you, that's the key. And if you can define who you are without any titles, without any position, without a dollar amount in the bank, define who you are without those things, then you actually get to decide who you are and what you want to become. That's exactly right. Brian, this is a phenomenal conversation that we could probably talk for another four hours on, but we're going to cut it off here and maybe we'll even do a round two. Brian, tell everyone where the best place to find you is. So I think most people live on social. I'm at Bogart Brian on, uh, on all social channels. If you want to learn more, get more access to resources, go to brianbogart.com. Um, that's going to be a central holding place. Uh, Bogart Companies is the holding company for all the entities that we have that help perpetuate the who in the world. Um, and what you'll know and what you'll see is regardless of where you find us, 
I'm very aware that 99.9999999999% of that billion will never pay us a dollar. And I'm very okay with that because I know those that lean in, those that choose to invest in themselves, invest in what we're doing in our mission will create all the resources necessary to perpetuate that impact. So I'm going to ask you, if you see something that resonates, not just because you saw it, like, does it resonate? Does it move you? Move people, move people. What I'm saying is if you see any of the content, any of the articles, anything, and it resonates with you, please share it. Not for vanity's sake, just because truly we want to impact as many eyeballs, as many thoughts, as many hearts, as many minds as we possibly can. And, and we need all the help we can get because it's collective impact. And I'm asking you to be a part of the journey. Thanks again, Brian. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Architect. To listen to all our past shows, visit nonprofitarchitect.org. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Thank you.